issues. So the next speaker is one of the event directors, Luis Felipe, and he's going to talk about phonon transport in graphene, HBN superlattices, coherence, and localization. Right. Um, thank you, Bruno. Um, sorry for the delay. And uh, Jesus. Well, okay. Now we're set. Let me thank the organizers for the invitation. Well, not really, but uh, let me thank you all guys for, uh, for coming. It's, uh, it's great to have all of you here. And now I'm going to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, the work we've been doing here uh, in Natal, in my group. We are the, the Transport in Nanostructures group at the Physics Department. Uh, this is our, our website if you, if you want to check out some, some more stuff. I'm just going to talk about one specific project that I've been doing for a few years uh, with a student. Uh, Isaac, who's, uh, who's over here, and also with my collaborator Anderson, who'll be speaking tomorrow. Um, <coughs> and uh, so, essentially, deals with uh, you know phonon heat transport in, uh, in graphene and um, boron nitride super lattices. Uh, let me tell you, you know, what kind of super lattices or, mean or what I mean by super lattices uh, first, and then I'm gonna you know tell you a little bit about how we do our computational experiments. I mean, I'm not really. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not an experimentalist for sure, and I'm not really a theorist either. I'm a simulational physicist, which doesn't mean that I simulate work. It's just that uh, I simulate the physics in my computer. Um, <coughs> and then I'm going to you know, just give you the basics of you know, how we do these things with molecular dynamics and tell you our results, show you our results on thermal transporting periodic and quasi-periodic graphene BN super lattices. Uh, tell you a little bit about localization in disorder graphene sort of nanoribbons, and then uh, show that we are actually you can able to observe phonolocalization in, uh, in graphene BN super lattice. Now, I don't need to tell you, I mean, this is a 2D materials conference, right? I don't need to tell you too much about 2D materials. I don't need to convince you that they're nice and all. Yeah, everybody knows the story about graphene, you know, the material that shouldn't exist until these two guys and some other people didn't care much about that and went on and, and, and managed to uh, to isolate it or you know and measure its properties, uh, graphene wasn't alone in the in the 2D zoo. Soon enough, there were plenty of other materials, and you know once you have all these different materials, people start to combine them. So <coughs> it didn't take long until these uh, sort of van sort of van der Waals heterostructures were were proposed, where you can just pile them, and since all of these materials have different physical properties, you end up with with a uh, your, your Lego blocks, building things that are that can be quite different from the original ones. Uh, but the actual types of super lattices I'm interested in are, are in-plane heterostructures, right? So it's not van der Waals heterostructures, but they are in-plane. And they actually exist, at least, you know, uh, there are here there are just two experimental realizations, one with graphene and boron nitride, so these, uh, these stripes uh, they have, you know, he in, in this image here, they have about 100 micrometers in thickness, but um, they can be thinner or, or thicker than that. And it can only cannot only be done with graphene and BN, which are true monolayers, but also with uh, these, these calcogenides have also been fabricated, you know, with the, you have interfaces with atomic precision. So this is the type of system, I'm, I'm, I'm that's what I mean when I say a super lattice, okay? Now, uh, about the computer experiment. Well, most of you are physicists. I think um, this week we are quite uh, homogeneous in that sense. And as you might know, I mean, physics is an empirical science, right? I mean, it's based on, uh, on observations of nature to investigate uh, the, the prop its properties. Now, experimental physics, some of you here uh, work on this, it's the branch of physics where, you know, which employs experiments or, or experimental setups to investigate this phenomenon and measure the quantities, right? Theoretical physics is the branch in which the experiments are done with pen, paper, imagination, and today, computers as well. But um, the, you, the computer is just used uh, to solve the problem, right? Essentially, uh, nothing new is coming out of there in the sense that, I mean, all, all you, you're just solving the equation. So that's numerical calculations, you know, it's, uh, for me, that's within the, the, the range of uh, theoretical physics. And then there's the simulational physics, which is uh, you know, the branch in which the experiments are done in the computer. Right? So that's what I mean when I, when I talk about simulations. If you go to this book uh, on Monte Carlo simulations written by these, these two nice 
uh, gentleman, uh, you find this, this picture here. So, and some people call it the Landau Triangle. It's not the, the famous uh, Russian Landau, but you know, a, a distant cousin of him, probably. And uh, the idea is that you can use both. I mean, you can use either theory, experiment, or simulations to probe nature. So you have nature in the center of this triangle. And of course, they all uh, complement each other. <coughs> a few years ago, we did an event with, uh, with uh, David Lando here, and then uh, the graphic designer, Giuliano, was kind enough to you know, prepare a modern version of the Lando triangle. Now, molecular dynamics, I mean, that's, that's most of what, you know, that's the tool I use to do my simulated experiments or my computer experiments. And uh, I like it because it's so simple at least in principle, right? I mean, you're just solving really Newton's equations of motion. So that's Newton's second law. Uh, you need initial positions and velocities, and you need to describe the forces about, you know, that the particles exert on each other. Uh, these forces, I mean, they can be described by empirical potentials from very simple ones to very complex ones. That's usually, you know, the most uh, important part of, uh, of molecular dynamic simulations. And then, of course, at each Time step, you know, you have, you can calculate energies, temperature, pressure, volume, and you can also control some of these quantities, like temperature and pressure can be controlled with the uh, thermostats and barostats. So the super, uh, the simplest al molecular dynamics algorithm would be something like this. You have the initial position and initial velocities. Then you can calculate the forces, which normally is a function of, of the um, positions. Could be a function of velocity as well in principle. Um, you calculate the acceleration. From that, you have the velocity at the next step and the position at the next step, and then you go back and iterate this thing until you're, you're satisfied. So that's, that's very simple, right? I mean, I, at least I think so. Um, and then in my computer, you know, a beautiful diamond like that. It's, uh, you know, it's a bit bigger than the one that, uh, what's her name again? Anne Hathaway was, was in the wearing the picture this morning. In my computer, it looks like this, right? These are the carbon atoms in the, in the diamond structure. And we can simulate these things at different temperatures. So you can see they're vibrating here at uh, 100K. At 300K, you see the vibrations are, are more visible. And then if you go to 1000K, they get even more visible. And I can do, in principle, any temperature I want. Now, we can use molecular dynamics to, calcula uh, to, 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 the thermo to calculate the phonon thermal transport of, uh, of the system. In general, we do what we call non-equilibrium molecular dynamics. So, you know, this is in, in some ways fairly close to what is actually done in these types of experiments. I have my system here, so it will be the, the system will be all this part. I can heat up this this bit and cool down this bit, or just leave it at say at room temperature, for example. You know, just as as long as there is a temperature difference here, there will be a current, a heat current, flowing from the hot part to the cold part, and then the thermal conductivity, this, this heat, uh, you know, from Fourier law, this heat current is uh, proportional to the temperature gradient. The constant of proportionality is the thermal conductivity. So I can just calculate the thermal conductivity if I have, if I know the, the heat current, and if I know the temperature gradient. In molecular dynamics, there are many ways of doing these things. Um, but um, the simplest non-equilibrium methods are the so-called uh, dira direct non-equilibrium molecular dynamics method in which you impose a temperature gradient in the system and that's c that creates the heat flux. Um, so let's say you can connect this part of the system to a thermostat, um, which means you keep, uh, you keep changing the velocities, you keep increasing the velocities of the, uh, of the atoms that are here. So you know velocity is temperature, right? So you, know, you rise the temperature, you cool there, so you get a nice uh, temperature profile, and then you measure the heat flux. From that, you can you can calculate the the thermal conductivity. Or there is another very nice method or uh, way of doing this, which is the called the so-called reverse non-equilibrium molecular dynamics method. So it was originally proposed by by Florian Müller Plata uh, 20 years ago, and um, the idea here is that you impose a heat flux, and that creates the temperature gradient. The way to impose the heat flux is, is highly non-physical. I mean, uh, what you do is you get, you have the atoms that are in this region here and the ones in this region here, and you look for atoms here with um, small velocities or small kinetic energy, since it doesn't need to be uh, the same mass, 
and then you swap them with atoms here wh which have, have high velocities or high kinetic energies. And you know, if, you, if you keep doing this, this type of swaps, what happens is that uh, soon enough you're going to have a bunch of atoms here with high velocities or high kinetic energies, and here low velocities, so you create, you create the temperature gradient. Of course, the way of, you know, when you're swapping these particles, it's some sort of a, of a max or demon, it's something very unphysical, but it works beautifully. You know, you do it, and then you know the heat flux because the heat flux is simply the difference in kinetic energy of the particles that you, you are swapping, right? And then you start, at first there is some sort of transient period, and then this thing um, goes into a, into a stationary regime, and then you can measure the temperature gradient. You, know, you don't impose the temperature gradient, you measure it um, just by, you know, you, separate, you, you slice your system, you define several regions here, you take the average the average kinetic energy there, you have the temperature from equipartition. Um, so you then you use, a use for here a lot to calculate the, the conductivity and what you see is something like this, right? It depends on the length of the system, it depends on the, on the length, on the size of the system between the thermostats. As you increase uh, the, the this distance, this thing, the conductivity initially increases from small systems and then saturates. You know, this region is... So how do you choose uh, the time step of these swaps? I mean, when do you actually do the swapping and how many of those you actually swap? So it, it can be done every step, every MD step, or uh, you can do every 10 steps or every 100 steps. Um, the, the number of steps, I mean, how often you're going to do the swaps depends a bit on the system. Um, but you have to be a little careful because if you do the swaps too often, then you end up with a, with a very high heat flux and then with a very high temperature difference. You know, and your system can, I don't know, explode on one side, freeze on the other side, and that, that's you don't want. So you have to test that. But uh, once you get a feeling for it, it's not that difficult. Bruno. Um. And the curve you showed before, where you have the transient and then duration, you do this slices. You yeah, that one, for, for instance, yeah. Uh, here. The heat flux, for instance. The heat flux, okay. Yeah. You do this on, on no. minutes? No, no, the heat flux is for the whole system. I have it for, for the whole system. So I suppose the two techniques give you the same result, right? If or done, If done properly, yes. Okay, so is there any advantage in using one or the other? Um, this one is a little simpler because the only thing you have to adjust is how often you do the swaps. On the other one, you have to do to have thermostats. Then you have to know you have to control two thermostats essentially, and you know you have to be a little careful there because you don't want to be too far from the canonical distribution and all these sort of things. So this one is a bit simpler. Also, to I mean, yeah. Um <coughs> anyhow, so. When you do, if you keep increasing your system, then you know the thermal conductivity increases from uh, a small value to you know to large values, and then it saturates. So there's this region where the conductivity is increasing with length is you know the ballistic regime. So essentially, your your current is is going almost non uh, without much scattering, and then you reach the diffusive regime, and this is where we are mostly interested. Uh, this type of uh, of behavior here actually can be described by uh, um, something of this form. So the conductivity at a given length is, you know, or the it's inverse. It's the inverse of the intrinsic conductivity of the material. So it'd be the conductivity, you know, at the diffusive regime times the scaling here, one plus an effective mean free path divided by the system length. So when the system is small, right, this quantity here is large, and then this becomes small, and the other way around, when, when L is very large, this just goes to one, and the conductivity um, converges to the to the diffusive limit. It's just another way of writing it. Um, so how does this how do these things look in a real simulation? Okay, so um, some very often in in molecular dynamics, it's also convenient to have systems that are periodic. Okay, so we you know use periodic boundary conditions, uh, and then for that end, it's easier to have your hot region at the center 
and then you have the cold regions in the in the two ends of the system. So your the heat flux actually flows both ways. And then here, uh, this is for graphene. Okay, so you have uh, the heat flux in the initial region, and then this is the long time uh, behavior of it. And then you can calculate the the temperature in each in each region. You have here the the hot region and the cold region. The other cold region is just the image of that, and you can easily calculate the temperature gradient. So that's, that's very nice. Um, and yes, as uh, Pauliana asked, if you do things properly, you should get the same, uh, the same result. Unfortunately, you know, every once in a while, you find papers where people claim, oh, we did the simulations and the results are different. They shouldn't be. They're just not being careful enough. This is um, uh, a collection of results I have for graphene, so blue uh, the blue circles are for uh, non-equilibrium MD, so the so-called direct method. The green triangles are for the reverse method, and you see they are, you know, e essentially the same. Uh, then we did, we redid the simulations with a with a, a variation of this reverse method, and we get the red um, dots. And then we can use this this equation to fit the data. So in practice, that's how we actually do stuff, right? We don't do simulations for all possible sizes. We just we do a few sizes, and then we use the, this equation to, ex to, to fit, or we fit this equation to the data to get the thermal conductivity in the diffusive regime. In graphene, this is extremely important, because uh, as you can see here, we've done simulations up to s uh, graphene samples of 10 microns. You know, this is several million atoms in a molecular dynamic simulation. So it would be that on the order of 10 million or, or, so or more. Uh, but to actually get to the diffusive limit of graphene, you would need something uh, on the order of one millimeter. Please. Pure ignorance. Why do you care about the diffusive limit with respect to, to the ballistic limit? Why is it important? Why do I care? Yeah, why, why is it important physically or like for devices? So, no, no, we, we're logic? interested in, in, mati in materials in general, right? That you could just measure in a lab, not uh, super small graphene samples that you need to measuring in a very fancy lab like the, the ones you, you might have, right? Ah, so it's, uh, oh, how long? So if I will do it in the thermal conductivity and I measure it in like a very small stripes, I will be in the limit on the left hand side. Yeah, yeah, you can, you, you, there, are, there are several papers in the literature where people were measuring stuff here and here and yes. Oh, okay, okay, no, thank you. And uh, also, with these with this, uh, this simulations that we did here as well, we get the, a number for the thermal conductivity that is uh, very close to high precision experiments get as well these days, right? The problem is you need to have a, a one millimeter single crystal graphene uh, sample, which is not easy to, to come around. But the, the take home message of all this, like whatever molecular dynamics method you choose, if properly done, they will provide you consistent results. Uh, we've been, we, we've shown it, we have a, a whole bunch of papers on calculating the thermal conductivity of graphene and fixing it. Started uh, with this paper in 2014 in collaboration with uh, uh, experimental groups in, in Singapore. And then we fixed uh, some problems in some of the methodology and we finally showed that everything uh, comes together very nicely in this, in this paper here. But, you know, why are we so interested in thermal conductivity? Well, what I, you know, the first time my students ask that, that's what I tell them, you know, well, you need to publish, you, you, I need to publish and you need to graduate. Uh, but seriously, of course, I mean, this is not enough. Uh, <coughs> there are applications for materials with high thermal conductivity, you know, in, in cooling devices. That's how I, f I, I started working actually on thermal transport in graphene. Um, there are thermoelectric materials, which, uh, or, or devices, right, we need high electronic conductivity, but low thermal conductivity. So the idea is how can we control the thermal conductivity of a material? How can we, you know, make it higher or lower? This is on the application side, but this is not enough either for myself at least. There's some fundamental physics in it, and that's, that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into right now. So first, the, you know, we look at the periodic graphene BN superlattice ribbons like the ones that uh, the image I showed at the beginning uh, that were grown on this paper where uh, um, Juan Carlos is, is one of the, one of the, the, the authors. Um, and you know, they didn't do only stripes, there were 
several other different types of, of structures with feature sizes of up to, to 10 nanometers, if I remember correctly. Um, for RMD, you know, whenever, w one of the shortcomings of cl doing molecular dynamics is that you need a good potential to describe the, the interatomic forces. So in this case, we're using the Tersoff potential, which was originally developed by Jerry Tersoff for carbon, silicon, germanium, and then people tar started trying to use it for graphene, but the parameters were not very good because it was, all it was designed to describe diamond. Uh, so Lucas and his uh, former collaborator, maybe still collaborator, right? Uh <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, Reparametrized the, 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 the potential for specifically for graphene and carbon nanotubes. And then uh, these guys came around and prepared parameters for boron nitride, also uh, on uh, you know, HBN, I mean, uh, is that the, the monolayer. And these, these parameters are coupled with these. And then with that, we can describe, this is the, um, the phonon dispersion of, of graphene. Points are experiments, and then the, the lines are from the potential. And this is for uh, HBN. So as you see, uh, the potential captures quite well the acoustic modes, not so well um, the optical modes. But since we're talking about thermal conductivity, we are mostly focused on, on the acoustic modes. So this is, is quite good for us. And then uh, we can build our super lattices with any width that we want. Uh <coughs> um, these results are, are, are in this paper that came up last year. So here we have uh, a, a periodic super lattice of BN and graphene. So we have a period length, which would be the width or the width of a uh, of, of, uh, BN and graphene. Okay, each one. They are always equal. We always deal with uh, situations we, we call it domain size. The domain size is the size of the part of just graphene, of just PN. And we always deal with them equally. You they, could, they don't have necessarily to be equal, but there's no, you don't add any new physics to that. And we can change the size of these, these domains or this, this uh, period length and see what happens. Um, just uh, to, get to show you, I mean, we, we did the, the reverse method. So the hot region is here in the center, and then we have uh, the temperature gradient. When we do that for the smallest uh, period length here of 0.86 nanometers, so 8 point something angstrom, um, you see the thermal conductivity versus the sample length. Now, uh, this, is, this is one fixed period, and this is the length, and then you see it increasing nicely, and we can come and do our fitting and get the thermal conductivity of uh, what would be for a ribbon like that. And then we increase the, period, the, the size of the domains, the period length, and then the thermal conductivity decreases a bit. And then we increase it more, the thermal conductivity decreases again. And then we increase it more, and it goes up. Right? So if we look at the full, the full um, um, sizes, let's say, so we have here the smallest. Uh, domain size, the smallest period, the second smallest, third smallest, and then the largest is goes back here. As you see, the in the diffusive limit, the thermal conductivities follow this order. Uh, just to show you the power of this fitting, right? I asked uh, Isaac afterwards to redo to to do simulations for larger systems that we hadn't included in the fit, right? So we did these simulations here up to um, 20, 30, 40. 60 nanometers approximately, and then we did the fitting, and we did the simulations to see if they would fit, they would fall within the fit, and they all fall quite nicely. If we actually add them in the fitting, it doesn't change the final, you know, the final uh, diffusive thermal conductivity. And then here, if I plot the thermal conductivity in the, in the diffusive limit versus the period length, you see there is this, this nice dip here. And then you know there is a it reaches a minimum here. It's hard to see, but uh, it's a bit a bit smaller. The same for that effective mean free path. You see that uh, it decreases and then increases again. Um, we were not the first people to observe this. This has been seen before in in super lattices, in nanowires, um, and it's it's well understood actually why you have the dip, because essentially what you have is a competition between 
a wave behavior and particle behavior for the, for the phonons. Okay, so uh, when you are when the period length is very small, then you know the wave packets say representing your phonon they are spread over several domains and they don't see all the interfaces between carbon and, and boron nitride. And with that, as you increase the size of the domains, they start to see more and more interfaces, so they get scattered and the thermal conductivity decreases. And then you get to a certain point where the domain size is so much larger than the actual uh, size of your wave packets, let's say, that they behave like particles. And then the thermal conductivity starts increasing again because you are decreasing the, de the density of interfaces. Um, also, this, this, so this transition is normally associated with uh, two regimes for transport, the coherent regime, where your phonons behave uh, you know, as waves, and the incoherent regime where your phonons behave like particles. So in the coherent regime, as you increase the domain sizes, the thermal conductivity decreases, and then as you in the incoherent regime, as you increase the domain sizes, the thermal conductivity increases. Um, what we did new actually, wha wha what was new in our work was that at least for the case of uh, graphene and boron nitride, I mean, all these monolayers, it's quite well known by now that the flexor of phonons are, are very important for the heat transport. Okay? So we suspected that these guys had some, some fault in this case as well. And then we can calculate the phonon vibrational, or the phonon density of states. It's just, uh, uh, this is the velocity autocorrelation, and then we take a Fourier transform of that. And then we have here this, the vibrational spectrum for our, our super lattices for different period length. And it's hard to compare anything on this scale but um, if we do something like this, so I'm actually comparing the, the vibrational density of states or the, the phonon population since I'm integrating up to a certain frequency uh, from of any pe lattice period with the smallest one. The factors of one are just uh, so that if delta n is positive, it means that I have th the population of phonons is higher at that frequency, and if it's smaller than, than, the one, than zero, sorry, greater than zero or smaller than zero, it means that the phonon population is lower. And then when we do that, we look at the uh, longitudinal acoustic and, and optical, transverse acoustic and optical. We don't see much in the low frequency region here, but then when we go to the ZA modes, what we see is that uh, the lattice period with, uh, that we for which we found the smallest thermal conductivity, which is the green curve here, you see, is the one with the lowest uh, would be the one with the lowest phonon population at the, at the low frequency regime. So, yes, the flexural phonons are responsible for carrying a lot of the heat in this super lattice, but they also participate in, in the scattering, right? And if you don't have um, if, if you have too many, if you don't have enough of them, um, well, you wouldn't you wouldn't have um, in this. You don't have, if you have very few of them, then you have a lower thermal conductivity. That's, uh, that's it. Um, so the conclusion is this transition from coherent to incoherent transport in graphene HBN super lattices is, re is actually you know, related to the behavior of the, of the flexural phonons in this, in this material. Um, as I said, this has been seen in other, in other types of materials, so nanowires, for example. And then I don't know if this would, uh, would happen there as well. I know, just know that nobody ever did this kind of analysis. Um, so next, I mean, what if the super lattice is not periodic? Um, for some reason, people here in the this, 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 this department of physics are tend to like quite a lot this Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> Manuel knows or what I'm talking about. I, I think most of you have, have heard of it, but in, in case you didn't. So the idea is to build uh, a certain sequence that is, is not periodic. So you, I be can begin with graphene and then boron nitride, and I put them together. And then now I start get the bit that was boron nitride and make it boron nitride and graphene. And I get the graphene and make it into boron nitride. And I keep doing this, and I build you know, all of these generations. And I can use these things as the, the unit cell for my, or the supercell for my uh, nanoribbons. So I have here. This, what we call the second generation of Fibonacci is just the periodic case, is the result we, we had before. And then you go to the third generation, fourth generation, fifth. You can do as many as you want. And now the, this sort of super lattice period increases with the, I mean, with the number of domains. 
very quickly, right? So uh, soon enough you have, I don't know, because you're always just adding them, so the next generation, the sixth generation would have 13 domains, and then the seventh generation would have 13 plus eight, uh, 20 something domains, and then so on and so forth. Uh, we can do the same thing we did before. We look at the, so the, the blue cur black curve is the one we had in the previous work, and then I have the third generation, this is for a fixed domain size, the smallest domain. And then I can do fourth generation, fifth, sixth, uh, seventh, eighth. And what you see is that the thermal conductivity in the diffusive limit here, right, is decreasing with the, with the generation. So if we look just for this domain size, we have this decrease here. Um, and then if I increase the domain a little bit, I have a decrease here, but then it sort of stabilizes for higher generations. And then as I increase the, keep increasing the domain, I see again this sort of uh, non-monotonic behavior, but then you see that, so this domain size here is the one that gave me the smallest thermal conductivity in the previous, in, in the periodic case. You see there's almost no change. It's always, uh, the thermal conductivity is quite uh, flat here. And then as I increase again, it starts to change some more. Now, what's also interesting is, is that is to notice that we have an inversion in this. So the, the thermal conductivity is higher for the smallest domain here, uh, and uh, and then it goes and comes back. Right? That was the second generation. That was the periodic case that we did before. But then these things are not the, the order is not kept. And actually, here when you get here, there is an inversion. So if we look the second generations, that case, you have the, the nice dip there. We go to the third and fourth generation. You see the dip is moving to the left, small moving to smaller domain sizes. Um, and then as we keep increasing, the dip essentially disappears. So it means that for these uh, Fibonacci sequences, you know, super last with this Fibonacci sequence, uh, you have no coherent regime. You have no coherent transport of phonons, at least, when you, as you increase the, um, the generation. So the, this quasi-periodicity suppresses the coherent so phonon so transport. Thing. Sorry, why do you know that it's not coherent? Well, how, how do you know that? I, I missed that. So the, the, mi the minimum is usually associated with a transition from coherent to incoherent. And if there is no minimum anymore, if the thermal conductivity always increases with the domain size or the, the, the super lattice period, it means that you are in the inco incoherent transport regime. Just this is how particles L behave. Let right? me then ask you the following question. What do you mean with coherent and incoherent then? Right. Um, I'm using it in a very loose sense here. So I just, by, by coherent, I mean that my phonons are actually, actually behave like waves. So I actually have wave packets that are, you know, with the lengths or size that are comparable to the domain's sizes. And by incoherent, I mean, you know, it's just particles, right? It's just uh, the, the, the wave behavior of the phonon is lost. Okay. I, I know this is, this I should have uh, pointed this out before because it, I'm using it in a very loose sense. Um, and then recently I did, the, I did an another work with my, my colleague Anderson, uh, who's, who's speaking tomorrow where we looked at uh, something you know, similar but not quite the same. We're looking at transmission of, uh, of uh, Dirac waves, sort of waves, in a, in a, a nanoribbon, graphene nanoribbon with, with disorder. So you have these potential barriers, and the potential barriers follow this Levy distribution. It's a strange uh, statistical distribution, normally characterized by a certain exponent, alpha, and then um, what, we s what happens is we're looking into localization in this type of thing, so uh, electronic so transport localization. Um, and then you have two main regimes. You have the standard or the Anderson or strong localization where the transmission decays exponentially with the system size, right, the system length. And there's also the, the anomalous or weak localization where the transmission decreases uh, like a power law. And in the case of, uh, of Levy, uh, type of a, a disorder following a Levy distribution, the exponent is actually the same as in the as the one characterizing the Levy distribution. Um, you can also, instead of looking at the transmission itself, you can look at the behavior of minus the log of the transmission, and then in this in the case of standard localization, it increases linearly, 
with the system length, whereas in the case of the weak localization, it increases with the, with the power law, with an exponent different from one. So we did was, what we did was to look at the, the, you know, the transmission for different energies as a function of system of the length, right? And then what you see here, this, this, this increase with the length for 20 MeV, 25 MeV, we're also increasing the, the, the incidence angle. Um, what you see is that the, the, the transmission or the log of the transmission always increases with a power law with an exponent alpha that's smaller than one, right? So it's this is curve there. But then as we increase the energy more, we go to 26 MeV, you see there's a clear change of, uh, of behavior here. So this thing that was a power law becomes linear. So here, the behavior is actually linear. These things are, are increasing you know, with the system length, but uh, with uh, an exponent one. But we didn't change the Levy distribution. We just changed uh, the, the energy, the incidence energy, and the angle. So after a certain angle, there's a critical angle at which the, the localization regime changes from standard to anomalous. We can actually build a phase diagram for this. So this is the incidence angle from zero to 1.5 radians. And then uh, the energy, if we go from 0 to 125 MeV, but we could, in principle, go to any energy we want. And then we see that uh, for energies below, so in, in this case, uh, the height of the barrier is always the same, it's 50 MeV. And then we have, uh, uh, say, the, the, the regime is always in the standard uh, localization, the system is always in the standard localization regime. But then for energies below this, if the incidence angle is low enough, you actually have uh, the anomalous localization, but also if the energy is high enough, even with small incidence angles, you, you back to the anomalous localization regime. So that's essentially what we were seeing there was taking a cut um, at a certain energy, right? And we were crossing, and that's why as we the angle increases, we see a, a difference in the, in, in the behavior. Now, that got me thinking, okay, so, you know, I have the conductivity uh, for, my, for my super lattices, then I can calculate the conductance. And the transmission, I mean, the, the conductance is disproportionate to the transmission. So I could probably see this type of behavior in my super lattices as well. And that's what I try to do. Uh, I, you know, it's easy enough to calculate the conductance from the conductivity. I just divide by the system length. And then I have here the second gen Fibonacci generation or the, the periodic case for different domain sizes, and then you see the conductance falling with the system length. But then if I see how, if I look into how it falls, it actually falls, so this is a log-log scale. It falls as a, as a power law, not as an exponential. Why, why is this surprising? Well, there have been some recent uh, works in the literature, both, I mean, experimental and, um, and computational, that can observe strong localization of phonons in disordered sort of super lattices. But that's not what we see. We see uh, the, the weak localization, at least for these systems. And then we go uh, higher. You know, we can do that for any generation. If you go all the way to the eighth generation, we see here, again, we still have this behavior. There's one thing that must be said. That I, I, I shouldn't have used alpha because this has nothing to do with the Levy distribution anymore. But this exponent is smaller than one. It's on the order of 0.7. I mean, you know, if it was a completely diffusive regime, you would expect to fall with uh, the, the conductance to, call to fall with 1 over L. But that's not the case here. It's falling a bit, a bit slower than that. So the, conductance, the thermal conductance behavior in, uh, in those uh, graphene BN super lattices is, is at least consistent with anomalous localization. We don't under fully understand these results yet. We're still working on it. But I, I wanted to show it to see if somebody has an idea of uh, that uh, could, uh, could help us understand a little better. So if feel free to, to approach me or, uh, or, or Anderson or Isaac if you, if you have any ideas. And then I can conclude now. So our take home messages from these, these three projects that, we, uh, that I showed. I mean, the transition from coherent to incoherent transporting in this graphene BN super lattices is related to the flexural phonons, as many of the, the, the thermal transport properties of, of monolayers are. Um, the quasi-periodicity in our super lattices suppresses 
this cohere the coherent phono transport completely, and then you're always in the in the incoherent regime. And uh, we see what looks like anomalous or weak localization uh, in the phonon transport in uh, graphene BN superlattices. These are a group here, Natal so Isaac is the, the PhD student finishing early next year. Uh, Trom as a postdoc is moving on now to Campinas and uh, Roberto is still working mostly on the electronic transport part. And uh, well, this is, as I said, our website, people who fund us and the supercomputing center at the university where we do all of our simulations. And uh, thank you for your attention. So we are now open for questions. So um, the point, can you go back to your conclusions? Yeah, so the point two and three, would you say they are connected? Let me try to understand what you did. Do you, do you actually calculate the phonon versions of the lattices? I have them, yes. Yeah, so and then for the Fibonacci as well. I 